Hey everyone. Um, thank you and welcome to Linkspace. Uh, this is the Women of Color Designer Series, um, which is part of Linkspace's uh, virtual salon programming. Uh, it was originally organized by um, Mel Ng and Elizabeth Mack, which is me. And also this roundtable discussion uh, celebrates the artistry and vision of women of color within various disciplines. Uh, we started with costume design and sound design, and this is part three of the series uh, with these three amazing set designers joining us, um, Melanie May, Yuki Zumihara, and Yvonne Miranda. And um, I'm excited also to welcome Tanya Oriana as our producer and moderator. Um, um, hi. Um, yeah, so I'm going to start off by introducing myself and my pronouns and where I'm calling in from, and then I'll invite um, everyone else on the panel tonight to introduce themselves. Um, so again, um, I'm Elizabeth Mack, um, I use she her pronouns, and I'm calling in from Singapore. Um, Tanya, go for it. Hi, everyone. I'm Tanya Oriana. I, my pronouns are she and her, and I'm uh, based in uh, Los Angeles, which is the land of the Tongva and Chumash people. Um, I will pass it to Yuki. Hi, I'm Yuki. Um, I'm originally from Japan, now based in Los Angeles. Um, I use she, her pronoun. Uh, and then I will pass it to Melanie. Hello, I'm Melanie. I'm from Colombia, uh, and I'm also swimming in from there, which is the land of Muisca. And the pronouns I use are she, her. I'll pass it to Yvonne. Thank you, Melanie. Uh, my name is Yvonne Miranda. I use she, her pronouns. And I'm recently relocated from Dallas, Texas to the Chicago area, which I believe is the occupied land of the Kikapu people. Um, Elizabeth, do we want to talk a little bit about how the series came about? Yeah, sure. Um, uh, so a little bit of background about this uh, salon series. Um, last year, um, I approached Mel and asked if she'd be interested in using the salon platform to increase visibility of women of color um, designers. And then I think also to talk about the topics that so many of us discuss in private. Um, and we wanted to have like one panel with all the disciplines included, but then when we started writing down and researching names, we realized there were just so many people that we knew and it would be really reductive to just ask one person to represent their discipline. So that's how we created this series. Um, and the idea is to have five panels in total, costume, sound, set, lighting, and projection, celebrating um, all the like the amazing work and amazing people that we know. So tonight, um, we're gonna start with our guest panelists sharing their work. So they could take some time to share whatever they like. And then um, it'll be followed by a round table discussion and then ending off with an open Q&A. Great, and we're gonna start off with Melanie. Thank you. Um, I'll share my screen now. Please let me know if you're seeing it. <laughs> Great. So this is a short play I put up um, that explores different work that I've done uh, aside from theater, which is, um, you know, something that I enjoy a lot. But I'm a set designer, but I'm also a designer without a last name, as I would like to say it. Um, so some of these are theater work that I've done in the past before living in New York City even. But I wanted to share it because um, I feel like diversifying your own projects is very important in what we do as designers, as set designers specifically. Uh, and one thing I, I like to do in the past with the shows that I've worked on is graphic design. So these are, this is a brand and exercise for a, an actual play we produce here in Bogota that was called um, Venus, Venus en Piel, which is Venus in Firm uh, by David Ives. And these were um, basically our version of the Playbill and I designed it. <laughs> and also the invitations to the premiere, uh, some other things we did. So as you see, um, the photographs also were staged and I was a part of that, the design team. 
Uh, this is a different show that is tonight at 8.30 that I did while I was a student at NYU. Uh, and I don't have the, like all of the information of my, you know, set design mostly can be found on my website, which um, Wingspace has shared with everyone. Uh, but this is like a backstage process that I wanted to show. Um, collage is a, a, a technique that allows me to think with my hands. Uh, so this was some of the very first work that I did before coming up with the set. Um, this is another play that I did here in Colombia, which I, I was part of the set design team, but I also got to design the costumes mainly. Um, this has been, this was like my very first immersive theater um, experience. And this is also a, a thing about theater that I really enjoy, you know, when uh, it's, it's more than a stage experience and it takes all over a place. Um, this is how I, how we presented the work. Uh, and, and I also love digital collage. So you, you'll see it in the second project as well. Um, this is a, a production we did with Roll the Bones um, in the Lower East Side. Uh, and these are some of my previous or, you know, concept artwork that I really enjoy doing. Uh, the next project is Tactile Flavors, is the translation of that. And this was, this is a project I love because it was my undergraduate project. Um, I, I didn't graduate as a theater design. Uh, that was, you know, what I came to New York to do at NYU. Um, but I, but I um, explored a lot of things related to design and, and food is something that I'm really attracted to, you know, working with, with food projects as well. Um, these are the collages I did for coming up with what I ended up doing. And this gives me the cue to talk about a project um, that I recently did that came out of nowhere for me. Uh, but there's this is this event takes place in France, and uh, it's basically like the Olympics of hot cuisine or or like high end, you know, culinary experiences. Uh, and it's called Bocuse d'Or, and it was the first time that Colombia was participating. Uh, so this contest has a, a big design component um, that it's a main platter. So I'll, I'll just go through some, some of the photos. So you have a sense of what, why I compare it to the Olympics. And the chefs have to cook in real time. Uh, you know, they have like two hours to put together like a huge meal. Um, but this year uh, that is, you know, uh, shown in a, a platter. Uh, but this year there, there was an additional um, component and it was basically the design of a takeaway box. So this is our team cooking and these were the, Take away boxes we ended up designing. Um, sorry. Um, this is a very well known Mexican chef called Beatriz Gonzalez tasting the plates. <laughs> and these are more photos of the team. This is the platter I got to design. <laughs> and I'll show more photos quickly. Um, but it's basically, to me, it was a great experience because it was basically creating a, a you know, a scale model in which the food could live. So what was magical about the process was that, you know, storytelling is, is at the heart of it. Um, so here are some shots of, oh, so this is a, <laughs> our chefs with the first model I did, like the, the on a one to one scale. And these were the, this, this was the kitchen where they were practicing and, What's next? These are these are details of you know the the flat the main platter, um, which was inspired by uh, orchids and Colombia's biodiversity. Um, ooh, this is really small. This were this was a photo of the chefs, you know, because they they basically had to to walk with this huge platter 
uh, in front of 14 judges that were, you know, qualifying our work. And uh, this is a close up of the takeaway. So it was basically this, this um, container made out of wood. Uh, it was legally, you know, <laughs> it was environmentally friendly the way we got the wood and, and all of it and the artisan handcrafted 14 of this because that's what we needed to do. <laughs> and um, this is part of the process. So basically I had to help the chefs to visualize the work. Uh, these are my, my sketches and, and this is the food that they presented. So it, it all came together behind the concept of biodiversity and like our orchids and how green our country is. And it was, it was really special, a really special process for me also to be able to, you know, draw this. And this is the official photo of our, of the, the platter. Um, so yeah, that, that was, that was the Bacuse Dory, which took place in September. This, are, this is a close up of the food they prepared on those two hours. <laughs> And uh, this is a, another close up of the takeaway and what was inside it. Oops. Um, it's loading, but I think these photos were super high res. So this was the dessert, and that was the main plate, just essentially what, well, the, the real version of the drawings I made. Um, and the last project I wanted to share here um, was another project I was recently involved with, uh, which was for a Mexican client. I came, you know, that reached out to me um, and she, she wanted to, she's an influencer and, and she's an entrepreneur. She's been at the Shark Tank version of Mexico, Mexico. And, um, oops, no, there we go. That's her. <laughs> and she basically wanted someone, she needed the help of a designer that, that um, could make a story for her, you know, that could make sense of what she was and how she was presenting herself to the world. Um, so it was also sort of a branding exercise but uh, I played a lot of, uh, with collage and with her photos, but essentially I crafted a story behind, um, you know, her and her sensibilities and um, came up with this proposal for her brand. Uh, so as you, so yeah, these are all words that were important for her and, and it was, a character building exercise as well. So it, it was not only her appearance, but it was also what her values were or what she stands up for and what language she expresses herself. So again, this is something you, you wouldn't think a set designer could do, but it's, it's at the core of what we do because you know we, we have this sensibility to, to um, read the world decoding the world and recoding it in, you know, just those are like terms I like to use. So all of these illustrations and all of this, you know, uh, making sense of who she was, what, what she wanted to tell, like what her premises were and, and how she can use this, you know, from social media to um, her presentations uh, was also what I did this year. And, yeah, I don't know how we're doing with time, but that, that was what I wanted to share with you all tonight, aside from my stage work. That's really cool. Thank you so much, Melanie. Of course, thank you. And yes, all of those were really exciting. I loved seeing learning about your process through non-traditional set design, which was exciting. Yeah, I feel it's very important, as I was saying, um, we, we as designers, regardless if we were doing a branding project or you know working with closer with communities I feel like we create and offer meaning for people 
Um, and, and the power of telling stories, whether they're fictional stories or real stories, is part of what we all do here. Um, and that's something I'm passionate and excited about, as I think you can tell. <laughs> Yeah, what were the words you used? Recoding? Decoding the world Decoding. and then decoding it for right. people to find meaning. Rebuilding. That's great. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for sharing. Um, and now let's uh, look at Yuki's work. Hi, everyone. Uh, let me share. Um, my name is Yuki. Um, I am from, before I do that, I should do this. I cannot multitask. <laughs> there we go. Um, I am originally um, uh, from Japan, uh, Shimonoseki City, which is the southern part of Japan. Um, and then I went to both undergrad and grad at UCLA. And um, since I have graduated, um, I have been mostly working in opera. And then this is um, the most, um, I'm going to just share a couple of like the sort of the most recent one. Um, I have been having the um, identity crisis. So um, uh, it's, hard, it's been so hard for me to update my website. Um, so it has not been updated for about four years, um, <laughs> which is terrible. Uh, but um, yeah, so um, this is a show I did in Opera Omaha, uh, uh, Caplet in the Montagues, which is Romeo and Juliet. Um, it's, uh, it was a postponed, 18 months because of the pandemic. Um, and then it's sort of one of the most traditional um, bel canto opera. Um, I'm not saying this in a bad way, um, but um, yeah, in a sense of traditional. Oh, my screen is having up. Let me actually stop share and then reshare again. Sorry. Technical difficulties. Sorry, I have to, I might have to go squid. Sorry. No problem. Take your time. Thank you. Yeah, um, the set, uh, yeah, so um, I was exploring the idea of um, politically polarized world um, where separation, so this was, when I was designing this around 2017, 18, so it was after election, um, so that um, responding to that polarized world and separation between um, two sides of the um, opinions being so extreme that there's no idea of celebration. So that includes the um, celebration of identity, um, celebration of culture or celebration of a new idea. Um, the director made fun of me saying that I just gave him a bunker. Um, but that was kind of um, after you get thrown in here, um, you wouldn't know how to come out or become or explore what's true you. That was um, the experiment I was going for. Um, the set had a change. Yeah, so it was um, inspired. A lot of the inspiration came from um, fascism, um, architecture, um, the tonality, the lighting as well. Um, originally, uh, I wanted to explore more um, a suffocated idea, but the idea was a little too expensive, <laughs> three times more. Um, so we had to always cut back. So yeah, um, but yeah, I showed this version because um, it felt like it's more like a, sort of a school work, um, something close to what you would do in the school work. Um, but I tried to keep as a designer um, thinking about, um, conceptual clarity. Uh, that's something that I tried to emphasize in design. 
I'm not so much of a, my background is actually um, not so much of an artist. I played martial arts um, six years, uh, didn't really study arts. So um, I'm still like in terms of expressing your emotion, um, uh, I think um, I'm still finding that. And then also um, when I'm working on some of the shows, it kind of always makes me question, why do I get to express my emotion when the story is about somebody? So um, that's something that I um, go through my, uh, that's something that goes through my head. Um, yeah, and then, so like that kind of a more of the traditional um, theater looking show to um, the next show that I want to talk about, Sanctuaries, um, which is a new opera written by a uh, composer, Daryl Grant. Um, and then it's about displacement of black community in Portland, Oregon. Um, we did this in a neighborhood where it was 75%, uh, 20 years ago was 75% uh, black community to now 90% white people. So um, yeah, and then a lot of people who were in the show um, were actually sharing their personal stories. So with this one, rather than designing the whole um, look, it was more about the experience and then the layout and then how people can share the story. So um, we went quite a bit, um, uh, originally it was gonna be in a, a, what's called a North Warehouse in the Albina um, community, uh, Albina neighborhood, which that 70%, um, um, 20 years ago, 70% of black people lived. But um, during pandemic, uh, pandemic hit, and then what happened was venue um, shut down. So uh, post pandemic, this was last September, we did it in um, what's called the Memorial Coliseum. Also to build this Coliseum or the um, stadium, um, they removed up like about 500 um, black um, people's home. So it, we essentially, that's the, I, we didn't need a set. That's already telling the story. So we were facing, um, we ended up facing that venue and then just simply doing a show there. So, um, yeah, that experience of um, ritual was something in this situation, uh, more than the set, that's sort of what I was um, designing. And then just like how Melanie was saying about um, sort of different kind of a diversifying um, or the what you do, um, this one actually was a film production I did with Boston Lyric Opera. Um, uh, Opera in general is still behind in terms of even the pants role, like in, in Romeo and Juliet. Um, uh, that production, we actually um, play, uh, Romeo was a female because traditionally it is because of the pants role, it's played by female, but we are seeing that uh, character as a male. So in the sort of um, thinking of can we look at the identity of the person who's actually play the, playing the role? So we were confronting the pants role or the idea of the pants role. Um, and then sort of similar to, and then which brought up a, of course, this question um, with some of the conservative um, audience. Uh, but so Desert Inn was another um, project that was uh, more about not necessarily the authorship that's um, seen in opera. Uh, how can we become more collaborative? And then also, um, how can also opera become queer positive and then also diverse? So that was something um, uh, in this project uh, we were um, playing with. This is a true waiver, but I might actually skip. I can skip soon. So this one, um, I did the title card design as well.
So yeah, that was um, Desert Inn and uh, I did wish this where we were able to uh, push a little bit more in the post-production, um, the language part of it, but this was us trying to figure out um, that part of film opera hybrid. So um, yeah. And then I also do um, graphic work as well, um, trying to sort of talk about what's tradition and then what do new idea, what how that is brought in. So yeah, that's what I do. And then I also included some of the slide because it looks, I felt like um, it looked polished, but um, the way I work is a lot more messier. Um, so just threw that in there too. Um, yeah, just kind of keeping it real, but um, yeah. Great, thank you so much, Yuki. Thank you. Yeah, I love seeing the process work and then also um, the idea that you could, that set designers are can be designing experiences and not always big scenic pieces. I think that's really exciting. Great, um, Yvonne, would you like to share some of your work with us? Uh, yes, give me a minute. Let's see. Can everyone see this? Yes. Uh, well, hello, my name is Yvonne Miranda and I am a set design, but a set designer, but that is not my, um, um, I would say main focus, and I kind of fell into it from the world of fashion. Um, after getting out of the military, I actually went to uh, undergrad in Texas, which is where I'm originally from, Dallas, Texas, and got my BFA in fashion design. On, let me change this here. Um, like most people who go into the military, I went in it to help pursue the dreams that I aspire to. And that was something I felt that led to the storytelling of clothing. I didn't know exactly what that was and that the fault at the time was fashion. And so I went, I got my degree and I found it actually very hard to try to find a job in Dallas, Texas, where it was geared towards fashion design, especially fashion that I wanted to do, which is very um, costumey, if you couldn't tell. <laughs> and so um, I ended up working for a company called Dickies, which is based in Fort Worth, Texas, and it is a clothing company. And I worked there for three years. While I was there, um, I was the design coordinator and I didn't really get to do much in the way of design except for this guy here, which if you are a native of Texas, you probably know about the Texas State Fair and this kind of scary, ginormous 50 foot animatronic host who, um, who greets everyone and he speaks. And so every three years he gets a new shirt. And so the year came up where they changed out his shirt and no one really wanted to design it. So they were like, you do it since you don't get to do a lot of things. And so this was a really interesting process because I went from just being the coordinator to having to present this idea to the CEO at the time of Dickies, which was very, um, which was a very daunting experience to say the least. And I don't even know how many of those shirt iterations I did. It was ridiculous. Um, but if you can see here, yeah, he's not too hot in the face there. He's kind of scared looking. <laughs> but um, but um, you have to make a mock-up of, of the shirt to get the proportions right. And everything was made in-house with awning fabric and the denim that they supplied for fire-resistant jeans. Um, and so, but I wasn't very happy in the corporate world and I knew it was something I didn't want to stick to. And then I actually knew, used to volunteer for an LGBTQ plus um, um, resource center in Dallas that had a fundraiser every third Saturday of the month called Gay Bingo. And we had a drag queen performer who actually her day job was working as an admin in the Meadows School of the Art at SMU. And we got to talking one day and she told me about the program. So I met with the professor, had an interview and they invited me to come and get my MFA. 
which I happily accepted. And that kind of has been what I've been doing for the last four years is um, being introduced to this world of theater. I don't come from the background of theater. So my approach has been like a little different from everyone else around me who's kind of been exposed to this for um, longer than I have. So I've had to deal with a huge learning curve, but it has been quite the journey and um, has been really fun. And I've gotten to do all these different, you know, shows. And while I also was at Dickie's, um, I used to have to do the window displays, which is kind of like set design. And I actually had to go to like the trade shows and set those up. And so while I was at SMU, I expressed a passion for scenic and I was just like, I might as well just go ahead and see what it is because this is a safe space for me to learn. And so that was something that I definitely explored and love. And that is kind of how I fell into the world of scenic through the route of window display designs. So I've gotten to do things like, um, like I've gotten to uh, do the production design for this movie here. Oh my God, I'm so sorry. My, my phone keeps going off. <laughs> Let me see if I can turn that off. So embarrassing. Anyway, okay, back to your regularly scheduled program. So I got to do um, this movie here, this independent movie actually at SMU, um, the Southern Methodist University, uh, where I received my MFA and he was actually a directing student there. And he, uh, I fell into doing the um, production design for that. So I can go ahead and show you the trailer for that movie. Oh, no, get out of that. All right, and so, um, yeah, so that was one of the projects that um, I got to do. And also, um, there have been some fun things that I fell into just because of my exposure um, in design action to some great designers there as well, um, Clint Ramos being one of them. Um, who has been really instrumental in helping, you know, me navigate the, this path that is very unfamiliar. And um, he put me up for this Red Bull Theater Presents Pericles, uh, Exploring Pericles, which is one of Shakespeare's lesser known plays. And we were asked as um, people of color, uh, rising designers to uh, do a response to that. So um, this was my take on it. Yeah, Yvonne, we, we're not hearing your sound. Uh, hold on. Yeah, you might have oh. to stop, stop share and then share the Yeah. Oh, great. The world of Zoom that we've been stuck on and we still can't figure stuff out. All right, hold on. I know how to fix this. Thank you for that. <laughs> yes, thanks, Luke. Can you hear it now?
Can you hear it now? No. No? Oh, that's unfortunate. I don't I don't know what else. Uh, I don't know how to remedy this. I can try. Um... Yeah, I think I sent you the file. Yeah. OK, thank you. OK, hi, everyone. My name is Yvonne. I'm here now. I recently just got married. Name changed. But anyway, that's besides the point. Um, I'm here for Red Bull Theaters presents Exploring Pericles as told by moi. <laughs> so let's go ahead and get into this. This is one of Shakespeare's lesser known plays. And as I progress through this, you will understand why. This motherfucker was extra as hell with all this shit that's going on. So anyway, we have King Antiochus here of Antioch. And if you cannot tell, he is giving us pervert fucking vibes like a motherfucker. And so he is straight up on some Donald Trump, I want to bone my fucking daughter Ivanka Trump shit. Just, this is not a vibe. This is dead ass, just like some nasty ghetto ass fucking Alabama bullshit. So... <laughs> He's like, okay, I have a riddle and my daughter, anybody who can answer this riddle, they will get to marry her. So we have Pericles, Prince of Tyre here. Mm, that's an interesting name. Not sure I would visit some place named that. Anyway, um, to each his own. So he's like, bet, say less. I'm finna go over here, solve this fucking riddle and scoop this hoe up. And so then Princess of Antioch is like, um, here's the riddle. And then it is the most blatant, obvious answer, which I'm just so baffled as to why Shakespeare would have this the fucking riddle and basically it's just explaining like why like how she is in a relationship with her fathers on some old incest ass shit so pericles is like okay i want nothing to do with this i am turned off um i i do not want to marry her but also what do i do because if i don't answer the riddle they're going to kill me if i answer the riddle they're going to kill me because i'm going to be revealing that they are in an incestual relationship so he's like, you know what? I'm just gonna go ahead, head on out. You know, like, you know, this is, he's shook, you know, period. He's like, this is just not gonna work for me. And so then he goes home to Tyre and his advisor's like, I think you need to leave because I'm pretty sure this dude's gonna try to come after you. And he's like, you know what? Y you're right. I, I think he is too. Say less, I'm out. So he fucking hops on a ship. He fucking ends up in some place called Tarsus. And there's a King Cleon and a Queen Dionet. Dionysi, oh my god, like, why is her name like this? Fuck this, this bitch's name is Dion now. I'm renaming her. So anyway, King Cleon and Queen Dion, mm, that rhyme. Anyway, so he walks into a fucking famine, and so it is a hot dumpster fire. But lucky for them, he has corn potatoes or whatever the fuck these motherfuckers were eating back then. So he throws this shit, and like the Messiah, he fucking saves them, and they're like, oh, praise Perry, please, thank you. So then he hops in his ship again, and he fucking takes off, and he lands in another place fishermen pull him out <laughs> okay enough <laughs> I've, 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 <laughs> I've exposed you to enough of that but if you would love to watch that you can go on youtube to um uh to see it but basically um what the whole point was was like you know why shakespeare this english you know, he's not even a citizen of America. And it was like, why do we focus on him? Which was a big question I had as someone who was coming into theater. I'm like, this, this, who's this crusty, messy white man? And I had to, you know, do my research. And it turns out that he had a heavy influence on the English language with some of the words he created. And so I really like this mashup of Black culture being so prevalent in America with everything from like the language like AAVE which you know is Ebonics and how like you know people borrow so much of our slang but yet you know our hip-hop our clothes our attitude but then we are not represented a lot in the theater space like people think we are especially in the background you know there's not that many black women set designers um, and so, or, or sound or lighting in those technical fields. And so it was just really interesting for me. That was my response of this thing of language and how black people themselves have actually lent so many words to it as well. And so, um, and for me, I really find that I would like to mentor, um, um, especially uh, young black women, just because my road into this, industry has been 
so just strange and not straightforward just because I didn't have access to the resources that somebody else has had, especially when I went to grad school and I went to a predominantly white institution where people would be like, oh, my family is like, you know, we go to the opera, we go to the theater and America has made those types of things a luxury when they should not be. And there are a lot of people of color who don't know that what we do is an actual job. I didn't know that until like I went about it the way I did. Um, and so I thought about it as if I had to like take this and introduce this into my culture and, um, you know, get people interested, I would do it in this form to make it more fun. Um, why does it have to be this language that's, that people actually use as clout of like, I'm smart or I'm I'm better because I can quote Shakespeare or I know Shakespeare like I'm not impressed by that honestly because that's just not where I I come from and so it's this thing of like using it to elevate your educational status and um so it, it just ended up being something like that and I like to do a lot of fun projects that have nothing to do with what I do and it's weird because I get to do stuff like that all the time so but yeah, I think that's, that's, I think I've ran my 10 minutes. <laughs> Thank you for sharing, Yvonne. Yeah, I feel that a lot the first time I read Pericles, I was like, what, why are we, why are we, why are we doing this? And I would totally watch like your version of Pericles. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I think we're going to move on to the roundtable discussion. Um, Tanya will be moderating, um, and I'm going to turn my video off, but I'll monitor the chat. So if you have any questions, um, feel free to put the private chat me or put them in the public chat, and you know I'll bring them up. Yeah, so Tanya, go ahead. Do you want to introduce yourself and tell us about you? Uh, great, yes. I'm definitely going to go on YouTube and watch the end of that, just so you know, Yvonne. <laughs> I was ready to watch the whole thing through right now. Um, but hi, everyone. So I'm Tanya Oriana. I'm also a scenic designer. Um, I'm a member of Wing Space and also an organizing member of La Gente. Um, and I'm pretty passionate about both set design and advocacy. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm excited to uh, learn more about everyone here. And um, I just thought we'd start at the beginning. I really love hearing artists origin story and designer story and what your path into set design is. And I know, um, Yvonne, you talked about your path a little bit. Um, but yeah, I, uh, I don't know, maybe do you want to start with Yuki? Like, what's your what's your origin story into set design? Um, yeah, I first came here to do film or like arts in general. Um, uh, so between the age of like one to five, I spent actually my time in the United States, which um, uh, the uh, one of my friend's um, uh, mother actually um, took me to a ballet class or piano class, which um, we I haven't been exposed to. Um, and well, I didn't actually um, do them much, but um, yeah, and then once when I, uh, and then I actually did like how much sort of different you can be in the United States. Mm -hmm. So um, after going back to Japan, um, doing education there, um, I wanted to be an artist. Um, and yeah, I specifically first came here to do film, um, but uh, I fell in love with the live, I went to community college, um, and then I fell in love with um, live performance. I think that power of, I, um, I think me doing martial, uh, martial arts partially felt mm. that physical um, presence and language. I, I do like, even though I'm a designer and I'm not a performer, I do like that final form being that, having that presence at the end. So um I went to UCLA um graduated worked for a year but um I didn't know what to do with my visa <laughs> and my teacher offered me back so that's why I went to undergrad and grad to UCLA so yeah and then after that um uh working in music was always um my dream uh I think at the beginning it still is hard 
again, that op like especially that opera, like or music in general, what you're supposed to like it's the same as a Shakespeare, um, like what you're supposed to know and not like yeah that I think that's something that uh, but that what's supposed to is not why I like it though <laughs> that's something that um, that's usually my responses and yeah um, I try to be actually um, as much as I try to go towards that uh, their way. I do want to actually bring other people, those people, my way, in a mm -hmm. sense of, I think you can hear me why I love this art form. Um, so yeah, I try to push that, but yeah, sometimes it's successful, sometimes it's not. <laughs> I think we all have that experience, but yeah. That's great. Um, Melanie, what's your origin story into set design? <laughs> It's a long way, but um, I was into, I mean, growing up, I was part of a, a, of a musical group. So mm -hmm. I was, ever since I can remember, I was at the front stage, right? And then coming of age, I stopped singing and like was being, you know, an adolescent and all of that. And, and then I felt disconnected to that, but design was something, design in general was something that um, allowed me to express myself, but ha having some structure. So that felt like the right pathway. And the undergrad program I went in here in Colombia um, is, is like general design. So you get to experience all sorts of um, ways of designing and types of design, you know, from experience design to product or communication design. Uh, so there were a couple of classes or, a, you know, set of classes that I took that had to do with creative direction and not specifically theater design, but, but just, yeah, just in general, creative direction. <laughs> so I, I really liked that. Then I moved into, well, when I graduated, I was like, yeah, I'm going to find a real job. So advertising seemed, you know, something that made sense for me. Uh, but when I entered that world, I realized for me, it was an awful experience. And I went back and talked to one of my mentors and I was like, listen, I'm desperate. I don't know what I'm doing here. He was like, no, you should start working in theater. And I was like, okay, but why? He was like, no, you took all these classes. He was one of my professors from, from you know, those, those um, creative direction classes we had at undergrad. And then I started working in theater here and I completely fell in love because I reconnected, but now from the backstage. So it, it clicked there and, and I worked around three years here in Colombia before I moved to New York and I went to Tisch um, and, and yeah, those were the craziest years of my life, but I learned a lot. Um, as Ivan was saying, theater is not something that here in Colombia is very mainstream. You know, it's not part of our tradition. Um, and it's not something I was directly exposed to growing up. Uh, so I had to learn that. And, you know, grad school was, was that. And, definitely as Yuki was saying the the physical presence and and you know seeing seeing an act of performance like a scenic um how how you know shocking that is um made me fell in love with it mm. and yeah it I feel like it's it's also a luxury to be able to work uh in theater and it's something I feel very passionate about, but as I was saying at the beginning of my presentation, to me, it's, it's been, you know, uh, being able to re-encounter with that while doing other things. So I will always fall back into that. Hmm. That's great, thank you. Um, Yvonne, I know you, you talked a little bit about your origin story of getting into it through uh, window displays. You um, 
do you, what do you think is like the thing that made you stay in, in design after that? Um, I just, I like building the world. Ever since I was younger, my escape from, you know, the childhood that I had was reading. I really liked reading and imagining these worlds from the text that I was reading in the book you know, me making those pictures in my head. And I feel like scenic is the same thing. Like it's very challenging. I had a huge learning curve because again, I don't come from theater. And so here I am this almost 40 woman year old woman with like two kids and I'm in this program, no theater background. Everybody's talking and saying all this jargon. And I'm like, I don't know what the fuck y'all talking about. And it's like going over my head. And then I'm like, Oh, let me do set. And I'm like, I have to learn everything about a theater space first, like, like, you know, like a stage left, stage right, what a psych is, the difference between transparent and translucent, you know, trap door, like it tracks automation and, you know, a rake and all of that on top of already going for costumes, which is my main focus. And then learning a software program that is just the most finickiest like thing, Vectorworks, if you know, you know. And half the time I'm like, am I making this mistake or is it Vectorworks? And my professor was like, it's probably Vectorworks. And so, <laughs> and so I'm just like sitting here learning it. But even through all of that, I'm like, this is so exciting to just read a script, bring a concept, you know, I want to do this as if I'm looking through the gaze of somebody that's on LSD and then let me build it in purple. And then people are like, let me do that. I'm like, okay. So, you know, it's, it's like compared to where I came from, you know, getting shipped off to a war overseas at age 19, I knew nothing about and then having to work in a toxic corporate environment where it was one of those where families, I'm like, I don't know you people, like I'm going home and then getting to go over here to do this where people are actually interested in my ideas is just night and day and so you know it just really gave me this passion to stick with it even though I still have to learn all these you know new things and I just feel like that's just you know a side piece of what it is like I feel like as artists like every time we touch a new project we learn something new we we go in there thinking I got this and then all hell breaks loose and half the time you're just like trying to figure out how to get this you know train to the station which is very fun a lot of the times you know it's scary but it's still very exciting that like I get to make a living doing this compared to what I was doing. That's amazing. Um, I can hear so much joy in your voice when you talk about it which is nice. Oh, yeah. When you hear somebody say it's Friday a lot, I mean, you'll go do anything else. So, <laughs> Yeah, I feel like one of the things you were saying is like how we how we get to become experts on whatever it is with putting on stage. It's like study, you know, a different time, uh, different people. You know, I, I, I once had to um, design this Filipino musical. So that apparently had nothing to do with my culture, but you know, we're all human. So that's, that, that human connection is just so powerful on stage. And, and, and I think it's really valuable in, in becoming an expert, quote unquote expert, uh, but at least being really passionate about researching what you're working on, it's, it's also essential for what we do. Everyone had such different origin stories. I'm curious because uh, I love talking about aesthetics and, and personal approaches to aesthetics. Do you think your origin story uh, has affected your, your approach to aesthetics? Do you see a connection between where you come from and your aesthetics? Yes, definitely. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, I'm very anal about um, uniforms because I was in the military and because when I watch stuff, I clock it and it drives me crazy. And I'm like, why is that person's hair out of regulations? Like they would not be wearing that. And so like, do not go watch a war movie with me because you will just hear my mouth and be like, can you just shut up? And so, so when I had to design Anne Frank, do the costumes, 
the Nazi at the end that comes on for like five minutes, like I ended up spending more on his outfit compared to everybody else, just because I was like, we have to get this right because there will be somebody in the audience that'll be like, this is not right. And it actually took me the longest, almost up to the 11th hour to like figure out his uniform. Like I have like a research book on Nazis, but I had to, at the end of the day, end up calling um, a, a someone that I interned for who works on the man in the high castle high castle on um an amazon uh show because that is an alternate reality where like the nazis win and so she was very insightful and that's one of the things that i love about what we do is that like not only books can be resources but other artists who have had to do that you know um that helps as well you know uh all of us like lending that information about what we had to do to kind of like solve all these problems that crop up in theater hmm. Yeah, and then I think also because of that, like everybody, pe people can be the um, sort of the source of information and experience. Um, I think every time, like, I think that's even in school at the design project, you're designing the same show, but everybody comes out uh, like from the class, like designing something completely different. And then I think um, it's easy to describe, like, I think when people describe the plot of the show, everybody's gonna go some way, one way or the other, like similar. But when it comes to point of view and perspective, that's something that you have to bring in yourself um, for that, or also even the time you live in now. So yeah, I think that does definitely add to the design itself, yeah. Yeah, I feel like uh, what you were saying is, is just so on point because, um, to me, my approach to aesthetics comes from a critical standpoint. It's like questioning, in the same way, um, what we were looking at Yvonne's um, pericles, right? It's like, why, why is this relevant? Why should everyone else see it this way? So, so yeah, you can be very careful with your research and you should for, by all means, but, but being critical to your own approach even uh, i think it's also essential to to get a very you know unique way of telling a story again especially a story that's been told a thousand times before and then i think also what that telling a thousand times has normalized too because um yeah that shakespeare like what yvonne was saying like kind of like one of the things, even with the Romeo and Juliet, I didn't want to go Shakespeare um, of romantic because Romeo getting excused for killing people, um, like, but it's not necessary justice because he, like um, in this case, she hasn't thought through the consequences. So like, but that is normalized because if you do it for a girl, and then it's that like girl who's using used as a token. Um, the person's murder is just like sort of justified. That story is told. So like actually, even with the research, like it we went Dante's um because Romeo and Juliet comes from Dante's um uh the divine comedy, the paradise, which is talking a little like a lot more about circumstances. Mm -hmm. Um so yeah, but I do, I am kind of curious too, because um, I, uh, yeah, I still teach, I still teach at UCLA and everything. And then we always have that discussion. People always bring up the discussion of, well, there should be at least one Shakespeare show a year. And then I know with the people and character, but like, and then when I'm told that, well, they're, they have the best characters, I'm like, I don't know whether they have the best characters. Um, like, I don't know what the best, the idea of the best character is in that context, but anyways. That's interesting. I, I saw Yvonne, you made a, a face when uh, at that con, <laughs> there should be one Shakespeare show a year. <laughs> well, it's just, um, again, it's not like a broken record, no theater background. And when I went to the school, it was like this, like, oh, let's do Shakespeare. And then the flip side of that, 
there's like these black plays as well. And because I'm new to this and people say things, it's like, I'm expected to know that because I'm black, like I should know who August Wilson is. I should know who like, you know, Lynn Nottage is and I have to educate myself. But at the same time, me coming into this world and seeing the type of plays that are being, you know, put out there for Black stories, I'm turned off as a theater viewer because a lot of it is not geared towards me. It's a message for like white people. Mm. And I'm like, I live every day as, you know, a disenfranchised Black woman in this world. And so I don't want to go and see, you know, you know, trauma porn or see, you know, this story about where everything that's tied to my culture is about us being abused. And where are those other stories where like I get to be entertained? And so I actually got to, um, as a joke, I um, said to a friend, I should write a play about a black woman who goes into a salon because I had a salon hair appointment. And if you have a friend who's a black woman, you know, we spend a lot of time in there. It's like this cosmic joke of how long we have to sit because they double book and you're just like waiting there. And I made this joke about I should write a play about a black woman who goes into a salon and she falls asleep under a hair dryer and wakes up like 500 years in the future. And somebody actually produced that. And they were like, we're actually interested. And I'm like, are you serious? So I ended up having to write a play that was produced um, with a movement theater earlier this year in Dallas. And that was just like, it's just so wacky, the stuff that happens to me and that people listen to the shit that comes out of my mouth and they actually are like we should like do that and I'm like why are people I'm not qualified for, <laughs> for this but at the same time it's it's fun and it's like it really makes me interested to explore that because like I don't recall any stories of black women in the military you just see white cis men all the time whenever they tell their stories I took my ass over there and got shot at like you know I don't see any of those stories about you know women of color in the military that aren't linked to like abuse you know I don't see any stories about you know transgender people that aren't linked to abuse or, or anything else and so where are those fun stories where we can go as people who want to be entertained ourselves and watch and so it's it's really kind of dawn on me and it's like oh we have to go and do that ourselves because nobody else is going to do it the idea of somebody falling asleep at a hairdresser and waking up in the future and is a really good idea so I, there were no white it. people in the future also <laughs> so they woke up and there was only people of color on the planet <laughs> yeah I'm ready to watch that uh, <laughs> Uh, well, that kind of leads to my next question, which was what kind of plays and projects do you all enjoy working on? What are you drawn to? What are the like dream projects? Uh, I, I would like to do some just, I like to do stuff outside of the box that's crazy that it might not succeed, like high risk stuff. And um, that's really where my passion lay is at just because like, I've done, like, we've all, done, you know, the Shakespeare, like, how many times can we do Shakespeare? Like, so, but the way that I'm learning, the way that the theater industry is set up, like, you don't get to do that all the time, because Shakespeare is a bread and butter for a lot of theaters, and how they draw in their older, you know, um, ticket holders who have the money to spend for these performances, and then they drop in a little experimental shows every now and then or new work um but even then it's kind of like i want to do things that challenge me that push the boundaries and those are the shows when i go see that like i can't stop talking about once i leave the theater yeah i feel like new work for the most part is the most interesting to me um maybe whatever that has to do with music it, you know musical <laughs> more than just music. And, and I feel like um, watching Yvonne and Yuki's work today, I, I, really, I am really becoming interested on public space as well. You know, like how can you um, get out of the theater necessarily and, and, and make something that, you know, uh, this is a little bit off track, but um, theater is something that happens just you know, when a person is watching another one, you know, walk by, right? So, so how can we make it more spontaneous or maybe 
take it out of the box a little bit and put it in the public space. I, I think that interests me a lot. Mm. Yeah, for me too, actually that confronting part or changing the um, like, um, like that um, uh, uh, Melanie was saying, like decoding, like that part, like um, that journey of um, not necessarily responding, but, but like, um, even though if I were given a traditional, like, or the um, sort of the show that exists, I think anything that lets um, me bring in myself, I think that's what uh, makes um, me happy. That sounds very childish, but um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or yeah, what? What I think and everything too, yeah. Well, we all I think, think that's childish though, because I feel like everything that we touch is ours. Yeah. Like we, we've left a part of ourselves out there for people to view. Like it's like you said, it's like from our perspectives. And so, um, and I think that's what actually we all like is that like, we get to do this and people are watching it and they don't know that it's, you know, that that's us, we came up with that. Like those are ideas that we came together as a team of the collabor collaborators, you know, our, our scenic, our lighting, our directors, our actors, you know, our costumes, our sound. And this is the story that we all came up with, you know, to tell the world, to entertain you, to give a message, to say something. and. And I don't think that's childish at all. I think it, it is childish, but in a sense that like it's a childlike um, um, dream to be able to, to do that, to create a fantasy and make it real in the moment and the time for these people to suspend their disbelief and just enjoy what's in front of them instead of thinking about, you know, what's going on every day. And children <laughs> means represented or, or like misunderstood because I feel like children are honest unlike adults for the most part so that's a good thing actually yeah that I have two children they're too honest <laughs> <laughs> but like I think that's the thing like how authentic can you be yourself or how much are you allowed it's always so different and then I mean like I think there were times, so many times we all like wish that we were a child and just say exactly what we think. Mm -hmm. But I think a lot of times is that there's that situation that's, um, again, that's supposed to, that like the, the makes you fit in the box. Mm -hmm. um, and then, yeah, I think anytime if we get to push that boundary, yeah, it's a fun moment. I feel like I've encountered I've encountered that on the other side of the back ends when you're like trying to negotiate for things like a budget and costumes is one of those um, things where people kind of write off because they can dress themselves so they think they kind of know what you do and it is nothing to do with that and so when I read a script and I'm like this isn't enough money and an artistic director is like oh it's six actors I'm like they play 53 characters. <laughs> you have a blood drop. Somebody like, you know, somebody flies off. Like we have special effects. Like you start tallying it up. And I don't know about you all, but as a woman of color, I have come across like, you know, negative things. I've been too aggressive. I've been combative because I've negotiated, tried to negotiate always in a tactful way and professional, um, you know, for a better salary, a better budget because of lack of resources, you know, and it's like you're over here wanting, you know, this mansion and then you over here with like two cents, I got to pay my bills and there's this weird disconnect of like, you should be happy we're letting you do this hobby, you know, and I'm like, you should be lucky I'm designing a show for you. You know, like, I don't see it as that and I will always stand and empower women, especially like, don't go work for that. It's not the end of the world if they're not gonna respect you and they're trying to squeeze every cent out of you. They don't ask the scenic designer to go build the set. Why are you going and shopping and building all these clothes and doing the laundry? And it's like you're conditioning these theaters to think that they can continue to treat theater artists like this, you know? Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's really trying to like stand up and not work for those industries that try to abuse us like that and make it seem like we should be so lucky that we get to do this for a living it's like we still have to pay our bills 
Yeah, and then like that, talk, like sort of um one of the like um uh, you what we wanted when like like uh, the qual the qualified part like in that in that part like I felt like you know that having that idea is what makes us qualified um and then also like it, whether we are female or not female because. There were times I was actually like I know that the male was offered the job, and then I was actually the second choice, but mm -hmm. I did get the um, job. And then I there were times I was actually asking the company, "Would you have treated the previous designer the same way, or expected to do the same amount of work that I'm doing right now?" Um, and then uh, sometimes, like there are times I thought, oh, but maybe that person is more qualified, but I have to kind of reprogram myself. No, but I now have the job. Mm -hmm. So I am qualified. Um, so I think that like, um, yeah, that part, I forgot what the question was even. <laughs> I think there was, I think I was segue and took over with my banter. <laughs> we do have a question from, uh, from someone out in our um our, our audience um it is a, a question is tips for young designers i'm currently an undergrad so i'd love to hear your thoughts i think um for me um not getting stuck on i i think knowing like what skill but also your own language developing that Mm -hmm. um like what you believe in and that expression of what you believe in like um or even the way of you think is part of who you are mm -hmm. like and then kind of valuing that part and then not getting stuck to it's supposed to <laughs> yeah i think that's so important and you know you there this is a collaborative work right so so you'll hear a lot of opinions a lot of voices but you're your very own best friend and all you got so you better cheer yourself up and and yeah build that language and 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 trust yourself and pursue your ideas and 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 um verbalize them like your needs and what you want things to become because that in my experience has been a challenge just because not only I'm a female set designer, but also a, a woman of color. So, so that's just always going to add up to the, to the list. Um, my advice would be to educate yourself. And I don't mean that in a sense of academic. I think the thing that has made me very successful is because I'm scrappy and I'm a hustler and I know how to shut the system and make it my bitch. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people discount that, you know, um, they discount like being savvy, having the proper resources, having the networking, because what we do, there's, you don't go to Indeed and you don't like pick out a job here to do that. Like what we do is like word of mouth and people continuously working with you. So your reputation is key. You know, like I consistently work with the same people and when they go do things, they want me to go do that with them, you know? And so your reputation and how you work is great. Like being talented, okay, that's good, but knowing how to work with people a lot of the times is what they're looking for because you're going to be stuck with these people for a minute and what they're really trying to figure out is like can i stand being in a room with you for like a month of tech and so you really have to learn how to do that also don't take things personally and that's I, that's really hard for people to do but like because we're artists and so if somebody's like, oh, this looks like ugly, you know, your feelings are going to get hurt, but, but don't take it. I always try to look at a perspective because sometimes you're too close to things. I once had one of my colleagues be like, this looks like Disney on ice. And I was like, you're right. It does. Like I had to take a moment and stand back. I was like, this, you're right. You know? And it's like, what did I do that didn't visually communicate what I was actually trying to do? Um, and I would also say no fear. This fear of like, I'm never going to get work again. I don't know where that came from. I hate capitalism. I live in it. I love nice shoes, expensive things. But at the same time, I don't let it run me like that. Like I would rather 
go work at McDonald's and get a steady paycheck than have to work in an abusive environment or work there because I think I need to get the credits on my resume. Like there are other things that you can do. Like do not fear. Being fired is not the worst thing in the world that is going to happen to you. Trust me. Hmm. Um, on that note, I think we're going to move into the open uh question and answer session. And we have a couple of questions coming from our uh, Facebook audience. Um, the first one I'll do, um, being a woman of color, you're usually the different one in the production group. If you feel uncomfortable in the room, what do you do? Any tips? I don't ever feel uncomfortable going into the room because I know I deserve to be in that space just as much as anybody else. And so I don't care if I'm in a room full of white guys, I've been at war with a bunch of white guys, you know, so it's kind of like it, I go in there and obviously if boundaries are crossed, it's, it's kind of like, wait a minute, you know, you have to check that because people will try to get away with stuff, but I just, I don't know, I just, being in the military was one of the most empowering things for me getting out. And any space I walk into, I know I deserve to be there just as much as anybody else. I feel like it's, you know, it depends because it, it's not everyone's sensibility. Mm -hmm. Like my, my first impulse as well is, is just to speak out and, and you know, say what, I, what I'm feeling. But I've learned with experience and, and this, you know, some people might agree or not, but um, speaking last has helped me a lot because I get to listen to everyone else, everyone else's thoughts, ideas, or, or feelings. And then I get, I have a little bit of time and room to, um, you know, need those thoughts and, and then express a, an informed, you know, opinion or whatever that is, uh, or a better way of expressing my, uncomfortable feeling yeah I sometimes still actually do feel uncomfortable like right out of actually school was when I felt so uncomfortable almost every time to the point that actually like that was part of the reason why like uh it, it's so unhealthy so that's this is not advice um but I'm just kind of being opened um uh in a sense of how I was uh because um yeah I was actually uncomfortable presenting um, every time I had to present a design and everything that to the point that I actually um, worked hard on my presentation skills so that I don't have to be in the room when I present. That's how much I was <laughs> nervous. Also, it's not only like actually not only the uh, woman of a being a woman of a color, I'm actually I, I also in general have a fear of talking in front of people. Um, and an idea. So um, it is a combination of that, but um, there were specific times I actually did feel uncomfortable because I felt like, oh, I designed for like my people in a sense of people I thought will be the audience, but I didn't like when I'm presenting, it's not them. Like it was like a design presentation um, is not for um them it's for the board members um like the ceo of the companies and such that um when i forget the purpose of my design uh i get insecure like my insecurity comes out and uh i don't know what to do uh so usually i always write out my premise of my design not for the show but my design and then i just try to grill that. So that's kind of how I um, got better. I'm not perfect still. Um, there are times I still actually do freeze and then not know and always come back home and thought like, oh, I should have said something. And then I do email. But again, that's a lot of um, process. Um, but yeah, I do. Um, yeah, I think by the time I start to get better. I started to get better when I was doing for other people. It was harder for do it for myself. I was going to add. Um, if anybody has any questions, feel free to unmute or turn on your camera so you know we can see your faces. Yeah. Um, I actually did want. I did have an answer to that question. If you don't mind me, like 
chiming in, but um, I usually, if I feel uncomfortable, I try to find an ally in the room. Like that has helped me a lot, like being introverted, being insecure, you know, like if I go in and I say, okay, I know that someone, you know, here, I can look to them if I need help or, you know, if I need backup. And it also helps with not just, you know, negotiating production things, but also negotiating like contract things. Um, so it's, I'm like, hey, you know, like I'm maybe getting shortchanged on the travel, you know, like what's going on on your end. And it's helpful to have like just someone else on the team in the room that, you know, you can like look to for something. That's very smart. Yeah, that's good advice. Um, we have a question from Facebook. Uh, Valencia Mallory says, who decides um, what makes the best characters? Like a theater, I'm wondering is whether that's the character of the, um, that's written in or character that's actually portrayed because I think that's also two different things. But I would say ultimately audience. Mm. <laughs> yes, for sure. Yeah, that was a good answer. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah. who's the fan favorite? <laughs> The smaller characters are always the better or well i don't i wouldn't say the better but but it's a different challenge for the actor and also for the designer like what do i get to say on this like small window of a character mm -hmm. are there any other questions Oh, Luke has a question. Is it okay if I ask it? Yes. Um, thank you all, first of all, so much. It's so cool seeing all your work. Um, the comment about like uh, kind of the insane amount of things you're supposed to know as a set designer really resonated with me a little bit. And I feel like one of the things that I struggle with is this feeling of like, I have to be an expert in everything um, and not, and often like limiting myself to only how good I am at something as opposed to how good one of my collaborators is or one of the craftspeople I'm working with. I'm wondering like what you guys would think, uh, you folks think the important skills are or important like core things a set designer might know if we would put aside stuff like drafting or like technique issues or something like that, like this kind of mountain of technique that we're, that has indicated like professional competency or something. Like, what do you think the things are that would be significant? And the battery on my phone, on my computer is low. So if I like disappear, that's not, please understand <laughs> I'm charger free right now. I feel like um, on, well, on my end, I don't know if this, you know, is professional advice or um, or on the professional end, but it's always uh, know what the reason why you like an image, like a research image, because we tend to um, like something and sometimes not question why we like it, just knowing that we do. So so it's, it's maybe the style of the photograph, it's maybe like a piece of architecture that you can build into your set, uh, but I, I, I mean, the first thing that came into my mind was always know why you do something. Hmm. I would agree to that because um, coming in the way I did, obviously that huge learning curve, like I got a lot of compliments on my stuff because I actually come from a visual arts background. I went to Booker T. Washington High School for the performing and visual arts um, for drawing and like doing stuff with clay and painting. And so a lot of times like visually, um, those are things that inspire me, but at the same time, it's like, how does this serve the story? At the end of the day, everything else is just decoration because you kind of just don't even need any of that a lot of the times it's like you know like really like what do I need a door and a window and a chair everything else is like decoration so you have to ground yourself in the text at the end of the day 
And, um, and so if you can do that and sell people and on the story, like you have to be just as passionate and have that discussion with the director and both be in sync on like what it is we're trying to tell this story, all that other stuff will just like fall into place, I, I believe. Yeah, I agree too, actually, like that, actually your design actually does have consequences. Mm -hmm. And then like sort of how that, like what, like exactly what Yvonne was, saying, Yvonne was saying, how that lands to the audience or that people who you're presenting and then uh, what that add to culture continuously. So that's something, yeah. Um, that's harder to, I feel like, learn. Um, and then that's kind of, I think, where the design um, classes critique is one of the most um, important thing, like not just a class, I feel like. I think it just amongst all of um, us to be able to actually honestly talk what landed, what didn't. Uh, like, um, I think that's such a valuable um, allyship and asset for each other. I feel like adding one small thing based on what Yuki said, and, and it's like being, and this makes you a professional, like being prepared to talk about other people's work, like your collaborators, like being able to respond. And that's something that you learn through critique, you know, going through, um, a, a, an MFA or a design program, like that's what you practice on and on and on. And, and you have to, again, verbalize these things. So, so being able to respond and, and articulate your words, not only for your work, but for your collaborators or other people's work, it's really important, I think. Yeah, and I would piggyback off of this saying that is really important as doing costumes and getting to do both because it's like when when I did one set, I made it completely white so that that way the costume designer, when she brought in color, it was like this blank canvas in the back that made her stuff pop. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, you also have sometimes issues with um, the technical side of things as far as like with the same set that I did, I had a spiral, two spiral staircases and they were turned a certain way. And they changed them because they were like, oh, it didn't fit there. And I was like, why didn't you ask? I was like, that was like, I designed it that way because it was a moment for when they came down, they were facing the audience. Now their back is facing the audience. It's like, there's a rhyme and reason why I did this the way I did, you know? Mm -hmm. And so the, those moments, you know, they there's a reason they're like that because I'm telling the story for the audience a certain way. And I'm envisioning in my head how this is supposed to be. And so you changing it based off like this little technical, like, oh, we couldn't fit it here. Like, you know, you, you fucked up my moment. So, <laughs> so it's like, you know, there's a rhyme and reason um, um, to what we do, like you said, with the collaborators and us all trying to tell the story. So we're not all telling it at the same time in that moment and overpowering each other. Like this might be a lighting moment. This might be a costume moment. This might be to highlight the set or the sound, you know, they're all working in sync. So we get this beautiful story instead of this like, you know, kind of messy collage of like, where am I supposed to focus? I'm getting, I'm getting over, sens over sensory, you know, of what's going on here. So that's a fine ballet that, that has to be had with your collaborators. If you can't collaborate then, you shouldn't be in this industry because you're not just putting on this show by yourself. So as we uh, get ready to wrap up here, are there any more questions? I just have one last question that I wanted to ask. Um, what is an aspect of your process that brings you joy? I think. I think two things is that actually um, when I get an idea that I feel like it's right and then get to like either draw out planning part, that part is the most fun part. But also I think that sharing moment is like with actually both your collaborator and your um, uh, audience, like for me, actually, that sharing with the collaborator is as um, fun 
like that because I feel like that's that jamming tuning in moment that when that sort of frequency goes together um there are times like I do yes with the lighting cue even or even the sound cue I hear like a, whoa what's happening and then somebody enters on stage and I was like looking at the costume and I was like oh my god so like those are my favorite moments <laughs> Yeah, I feel like the beginning and the end, this might sound um, silly, but but um, just just the pleasure of, of, of reading the text and, and let it come out to your, like in your mind. And then uh, fast forward to you sitting in the audience and watch all the magic happens. I think those are my two like <laughs> favorite moments. I think that's everybody's we just we all talk about it like the in between is just like the logistics of seeing it through and that's just like you know a nightmare no matter where you are because you're just like is this am I going to deliver what I said I was going to deliver and then you get into tech and you're like please don't let anything blow up don't let anything fall off don't let anything you know anybody trip hurt themselves you know and I hope the director actually likes it and doesn't want to change anything major and so the coming up with the concept and having the dialogue with your collaborators on like how do you want to tell this story that's always interesting because honestly it's just like a kiki party you're all just like talking and it just segues into all these different experiences and you're like all right let's tell this this way and it's so fun to go on this journey with these other people and you and and then you get to see the final product at the end and how everybody responds to it that's great and um i just want to um on that note like thank everybody for coming and thank you to all three of you um i feel very um inspired by a lot of what you said and um, we do, uh, just at the end, we like to ask everyone to shout out any uh, women of color uh, set designers that they know. And if you identify as a, a woman of color set designer, drop your name in the chat and um, tell us about yourself. Give us your Instagram or your website. Yeah, I think Shertoria asked um, if Yuki and Melanie and Yvonne, if you can drop your Instagram handles in the chat as well. Mm -hmm. I remember. <laughs> yeah, I just did mine. Um, but um, there is Jocelyn. There's Jocelyn. I know Jocelyn. And um, there is a Rico Huffman who's out on the West Coast. And Oh my gosh, I really have to say those are like the only two women of color that I know in set design. Yeah, I, I think I, I was off the top of my head. Yeah, uh, for me, I mean, um, uh, uh, we are friends, but like, yeah, Tanya and then also Iyun, uh, Iyun Nam. Um, yeah, like they are um, very, yeah. Yeah, I feel like all of the women of color I know have moved into production design for film, which mm -hmm. is a bit sad for me, <laughs> which I love. I mean, I've done as well, but uh, my shout out goes to La Gente Network, which Tanya also mentioned at the beginning. I, I feel I, I am a part of it and I, I've been backstage. And I, I've given a little bit there too. Uh, but I feel what they do is great uh, for us Latinos. And shout out to Tanya, Daniela Villanueva, Regina Garcia, and like those are scenic designer names I I um, remembered. But you should definitely check the work of La Gente Network. That's great. Thank you, everyone. I was also going to shout out Regina, who uh, founded La Gente. So thank you for saying her name. Amazing. Thank you, everyone. Um, yeah, so to wrap up, um, uh, you can, uh, if you like to see more of the salons, you can go to wingspace.com slash events, and I can put that in the chat right now. Um, and then you can also follow us on Facebook um, with Wingspace TD, and I believe on Instagram at Wingspace and all the various channels and communications. <laughs> 
Um, uh, all the salons are supported by Wingspace and is paid out of our pockets um, through member donations as well um, as um, any of our donors. Um, but if you would like to um, send a donation, uh, you can to our PayPal. And I can also put, by, uh, put that in the chat is paypal.me slash Wingspace. Um, and if you want to see more of Wingspace's programming, you can go to our website at wingspace.com and you can add, um, follow, um, add yourself to our mailing list. Um, and the last thing I'll say is that um, all the salon topics um, come from members, but also if you're interested in the topic and you haven't seen it been produ being produced, like, you can write to salons at wingspace.com and someone will be like, yeah, we're really excited about your idea. Let's make it happen. Yes. Um, and I believe there is an, an upcoming salon, um, EL or Kate, I don't know if you want to chime in. Um, it's the next salon. It's going to be a, a salon okay. on shared shared leadership in theater and sort of, um, we have some really exciting panelists on that one as well. So on December 2nd. At 7.30, please come. Yeah. <laughs> So thank you, everyone. Thank you, Yuki. Thank you, Yvonne. Thank you, Melanie. Thank you, Tanya. Um, yes, for a great conversation. And everyone have a good night. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Yes, thank you very much and for all your effort into putting this together. And we'll see you next time. Thank you. Bye. Take care, everyone. Take Bye. care. Bye.